Well, here we go again. Yet another Oswald did it book. As if we need another Oswald did it book. It's from a gentleman by the name of Paul Brandis who has some clout. He might not be a Bugliosi or a Posner, but he's fairly well known. He wrote a somewhat acclaimed book on Jacqueline Kennedy. This Oswald did a book may or may not get a lot of press. Who knows? But the thing that really gets my ire up is one particular theme. This is what he wrote on Amazon. It's books on in pre-order. Brandis writes, The so-called crime of the century, the assassination of President Kennedy, was almost preordained to happen. Like all presidents for decades before him, JFK played it loose with security. Open cars, secret service agents at a distance, and a desire to be seen. Yet conspiracy buffs are certain the security setup on November 22nd, 1963 was unusual and suspicious. It wasn't. What a joke. The city of Dallas police have deployed over 700 men, but unusually, none are guarding Dallas's many high-rise rooftops. The major trip before in Florida and Tampa, 28 miles, almost three times the length of Dallas. They had multi-story building rooftops guarded with all the sheriff's department, with heavy arms. In fact, I spoke to the lead uh, motorcycle officer in Tampa. He told me, oh, every multi-story building at 28 miles had armed men, and they would have shot anybody untoward during that motorcade. We've got a pretty good crowd of people down here on Turtle Creek. Halfway down Main Street, FBI Special Agent James Hostie watches the motorcade pass by. He's shocked at how exposed the president and first lady are. All the Secret Service agents are in the car behind. When you realize the building rooftops weren't guarded, there's people hanging all out of windows. You realize they weren't on the back of the car in a concentrated fashion. And there wasn't more motorcycles bracketing the car and even the use of the bubble top. It makes you realize how much Kennedy was a sitting duck. Uh, 10 one is a pretty good crowd there. The motorcade turns off Main Street and enters Dealey Plaza. And they make a short right-hand turn onto Houston Street. In the presidential car, Jackie hears Governor Connolly's wife say to the president, you certainly can't say that the people of Dallas haven't given you a nice welcome. And the president says, no, you sure can't. Then they make the really tight jog onto Elm Street. Now, this was all a violation of Secret Service protocol and common sense. You're never supposed to take the president in a situation where you're slowing the car down like that. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president. Here was killed. The Secret Service agents normally walk directly beside the car on either side. We do not see any in this photograph, but usually uh, two or three Secret Service agents will walk on either side of the car uh, so that they are there to uh, spot any anyone who looks like a, a troublemaker. Uh, for firing the shot. It's most unusual, incidentally, that such a thing could happen because of the uh, unusually tight security measures that are ordinarily taken by the uh, Secret Service who guard the president. And uh, normally any vantage point, a rooftop, and uh, windows which command uh, a parade route are carefully scrutinized and carefully guarded and men are usually posted on rooftops along a parade route uh, particularly if there is any any reason at all to suppose that there might be someone in the area who would have uh, uh, such ideas as assassination in his mind regarding the president these precautions of course are taken by the secret service for all presidents as they have been for many years
episode made me angry. It didn't make me angry. We're talking about the President of the United States. And uh, I'm not a holier-than-thou guy. And in the 1960s, I believe that we can demonstrate so that all the world will want to follow our example that freedom and prosperity can move hand in hand. I express our thanks to you, and I can tell you... In Mr. Kennedy's new presidential limousine, the two presidents acknowledge the cheers of the throngs. The end of the parade finds the presidential party at the Blair House, the president's official guest house, where the distinct... Mr. Kennedy ki nai limousine se dono through the streets of Berlin began. The entire route was lined with people who had waited hours to see the president, the man dedicated to the defense of peace and freedom. Never before had the Berliners turned out in such large numbers. Never was a reception so rousing. And here also is one of the dramatic points where Ost and West sich gegenüberstehen. Wenn Berlin ein Vorposten der freien Welt ist, dann ist der Checkpoint Charlie einer der vorgeschobensten Posten, der am weitesten vorgeschobenen Posten der Soldaten des Präsidenten. dort heimkehrende Helden der Nation gefeiert werden. Der Weg John F. Kennedys zum Schöneberger Rathaus wird zu einer einzigen Triumphfahrt. Kennedy hat auf eigenen Wunsch auf den Platz in der Mitte des Wagens verzichtet, um sich gelegentlich wegen seiner Rückenschmerzen seitlich am Wagenrand abstützen zu können. Von den Strapazen der letzten Tage ist ihm jetzt aber nichts anzumerken. General Lucius D. Clay, Initiator der Berliner Luftbrücke, die die Stadt während der zehnmonatigen sowjetischen Blockade am Leben hielt und den die Berliner deshalb außerordentlich lieben, 
der mit dem Präsidenten nach Deutschland gekommen ist. Er sagt zu ihm, bevor dieser Tag zu Ende gegangen ist, werden sie 90 Prozent der Berliner gesehen und kennengelernt haben. Pierre Salinger, Kennedys Pressechef, ein eher hartgesottener Mann, sagt später, dieser Empfang in Berlin ist der größte, der dem Präsidenten irgendwo in der Welt zuteil geworden ist. Am frühen Vormittag hat Kennedy den Gewerkschaftstag der IG Bausteine Erden in der Berliner Kongresshalle besucht. In einer kurzen Ansprache hat er dort betont, freie Gewerkschaften seien eine wichtige Voraussetzung für das Funktionieren der Demokratie. Freiheit aber sei nicht nur ein Ziel, sondern auch ein Mittel und ein Weg für ein besseres Leben aller Menschen auf dieser Erde. Freiheit und ihre Unteilbarkeit ist das Grundmotiv der Rede, die John F. Kennedy vor dem Stöhneberger Rathaus halten wird. Sie ist mitbestimmt von den Eindrücken, die er an der Berliner Mauer erhalten hat und die ihn tief bewegt haben. Kennedy sagt, die Mauer sei die abscheulichste und stärkste Demonstration für das Versagen des kommunistischen Systems. Und was für Berlin gelte, das gelte auch für ganz Deutschland. Ein echter Friede in Europa könne nicht gewährleistet werden, solange jedem vierten Deutschen das Recht der freien Wahl vorenthalten würde. War die Ansprache in der Frankfurter Paulskirche die inhaltlich bedeutendste?
America, December 1961. This covers uh, Puerto Rico trip. There you go. There's the bubble top agents by the car. Where the people make no secret of how warmly they feel about their guests. President Kennedy's destination now, the offices. And the other was uh, transparent plastic. And these different routes were put together. By laying wreaths at the tombs of two of Mexico's heroes, and then attending mass at the holiest of that nation's shrines, the Basilica of Guadalupe. They are greeted by the primate archbishop of Mexico, Miguel Gomez, who later led a prayer in English for the full success to all efforts made during the president's visit. After Mass, the Kennedys head for the airport and then home to Washington. Last week, there was uncertainty in capital circles about the President's reception in Mexico. It turned out to be one of his greatest triumphs in personal diplomacy. Friendship with personal warmth and with a personal welcome. for the Army, Air Force, and our allies. That's relaying our TV signal from the uh, mobile camera in the parade room. The uh, police uh, drive by quite frequently, uh, helping the Marines keep the crowd in check. The Marines, by the way, are stationed at 54th and El Cajon, where we have one of the biggest crowds of the route, are stationed about every five or six feet apart, and they've certainly had their hands full in keeping these people back because everybody's leaning forward, pushing to the front, knowing that the president's about to go by. The band in the background, Crawford High School Band, striking up. 
hoping that the president will be here any moment and uh, wanting to play some uh, stirring march music for him. May I again point out that the picture you see is not from 54th and El Cajon. The two press trucks, including a live mobile feed, still in motion photography, and more importantly, Marines facing the crowd five to six feet apart. It's from uh, a vantage point about four blocks west of where we are, looking west and seeing the first of the uh, motorcade as it goes by. And that's part of the crowd, the crowd lining the streets, lots of children, the Marines with their hands full. The motorcycle officer, I understand, has been instructed to make sure that everybody does not get out into the street. No reports of whether or not he has uh, run over any toes or not, but uh, doing a good job of keeping them by. Now, the presidential motorcade is approaching 54th and El Cajon. Everybody here is on his feet. The people are beginning to cheer. The people behind me are, of course, quite expectant and uh, quite, uh, quite excited about this occasion. First car coming by our camera at 54th and El Cajon is one.